On Saturday, she walked down to the garden. A friend would wait for her by the door. They sit down at the table, fifty years apart. Yet not a day has passed them by at all. Right. Welcome everybody back to the Rope It Up Lounge in VR and here live on multiple channels. Uh, thank you for tuning in. Uh, bear with me as I check check as we go. This is all very complicated. Uh, first, I want to say what we're doing. Um, the rope it up vr lounge is patched into this zoom meeting and vice versa so literally we're bridging uh alternate reality with virtual reality and the beauty of it is that we can then talk to each other and so if you're watching this you have the ability to observe in uh on youtube and on twitter and other channels but you also have the opportunity to participate if you uh have been in vr and can go to altvr.com uh, DJF688 is that beautiful room that you see there, and uh, we will be in and out of that room, and we'll be hanging after this to uh, chat with people, so please join us. This is called Healing Sound of the People. This is episode two, and the whole thing is created by Dorian Wallace, and what he's doing here is both writing a book and also... Uh, making a record. This is a whole new way to do this. There are going to be eight episodes, so join us throughout uh, the early part of 2023 uh, and uh, participate in that way. So without further ado, as they say, I'll pass the microphone over to Mr. Dorian Wallace. Welcome. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, really, really glad to see, uh, uh, to see everybody and um, glad to just have have involvement yet again. Um, so last episode uh, was around the concept of music and consciousness. And so what that means is um, just where does music exist uh, within our own psyche, as well as how does music impact uh, social consciousness? Um, and so that's where the second episode is um, themed around music and community. And this is uh, got two areas, um, you know, obviously, I hope obviously, I am interested in, interested in uh, social oriented music community making. Um, but there is also an element of antisocial music making. I've been just kind of going through a big cult phase, uh, learning about different dangerous cults and dangerous hate groups. And it's really, wild how music is actually used as a way to um to trap people into these spaces and so it's almost like the force in star wars uh you know where there's the the good side and the bad side but anyways the guest i have today uh returning from last uh last episode is uh the great lisa marie simmons who's a fellow rope artist uh really really amazing jazz singer um just sent me a video that we might check out some point today. Uh, if not, it'll definitely go in the chat. Um, and then I have my partner in justice, Dee Maurice uh, Steely, who uh, I do a lot of organizing with regarding Madari music uh, and um, working with violence affected and justice involved individuals. Um, and then uh, new with us today is Annie Levin, who's a comrade of mine from the Singing Solidarity Chorus. And Annie was uh, just uh, very heavily involved with the recent new school strike uh, for adjunct professors. And um, it was just uh, uh, one of those things where the timing kind of lined up perfectly. And it was like, Annie, um, do you want to come on to this, this panel? Uh, but um, before anything, uh, Lewis, could we take a listen to the first video, and just a little bit of uh, a little bit of um, background? This is uh, just a a 
improvisation on the classic protest song, Which Side Are You On?, which was written by uh, Florence Reese, who was the wife of a union organizer, Sam Reese, during the union mine workers in uh, strike in Harlan County. And I've always, uh, this song has actually stuck with me in a very philosophical way, because the question is always, which side are you on? Um, if there is an issue that needs to be addressed, you're gonna lean a direct, some kind of direction. And so the song has always been kind of meaningful for that. So if you can cue that up and then we'll start the, the conversation. Beautiful.
All right. All right. There we go. There we go. We are back. We are back. All right. So, um, you know, uh, thank you all for listening. Uh, and I wanted to start the conversation off with, uh, I'm going to ask a really specific question to uh, Annie, actually. But um, you were just involved in a strike. And uh, strikes are a communal movement in and of themselves. It's a, it's a group of people coming together to stand for something. Um, and I'm just interested, uh, what kind of role did music play during during the strike? And I just uh, am very curious what your perspective is on this. Yeah, I think that's a good question there. Um, I mean, it was the new school, which has the Manus School of Music and the jazz faculty who are not a part of our union, but were very much present on the, on the picket line. Um, there was chanting and singing every day. A lot of people from the Poor People's Campaign came down and, and led songs. Um, the uh, Rude Mechanical Orchestra, which is a popular uh, New York City um, protest uh, brass uh, marching band was there on the first day of the strike. And um, yeah, there was like chanting and singing was a, was a daily thing. And I think a lot of the um, we called them picket captains or or marshals on the strike uh, had to lead the chants and these were people who had not done this before and they wound up having to get like having to train their vocal cords to keep it up for hour after hour after hour after hour of yelling singing into a megaphone three five six hours a day I mean they weren't you, you wouldn't have one person do it the entire time but I always needed to have somebody so that to keep people moving on the picket line because in the united states we always like walk on our picket lines we always go in a circle on our picket lines marching around uh blocking entrances to um where uh where the, the workplace so we had yeah like there was music was a everyday regular presence and we like everybody participated in it Yeah. So um, before I like over talk, uh, I'm curious if uh, either Lisa or Di Marisa have had experience with with music and community, and just what are your takes takes on it? Um, I think it's really interesting what Annie was just um, talking about. Fascinating. I think that. Uh, chanting, it's such a galvanizer, right? It, 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 it just is something that we can all sort of um, gather behind and around. And, and chants are, are so interesting because of the format. Like all, I, I live in Italy, um, although I'm American, and in protest for Black Lives Matter here as well, even though there are things that are in Italian, the cadence is, stays the same. Right. And, and it's true across the board, like the what it is that 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 works, that gets into us and and allows us to um, sort of come together. They're the same cadences they're the same measures all around the world. Yeah, um, I feel like, well, I believe that all of my experiences with music have been in community. Um, you know, my daughter is a performer, and so my first um, real experiences in music were in that community. Um, but then I stumbled upon like kind of what music can I do, using music um, as a therapeutic, therapeutic tool. And with that, we've been able to build communities. Uh, but I think when I, you know, Thinking back to like just indigenous practices, music has always been a part of how we keep our community together, a part of how we communicate, um, articulating our feelings, articulating the times, um, articulating, you know, frustrations. And I think music is also just a universal way to organize. Um, so it's no coincidence that, you know, whenever we're doing things where we want to galvanize people, that music is somewhere ingrained in that. 
Um, because it just does something to you, that entrainment that happens. That, um, I don't know about y'all, but like when I hear certain sounds, it evokes something out of my spirit. It, it the music will dance with my heart, dance with um, just all of the, the, the feelings of being present. Um, and I've, I've experienced that happen amongst people despite differences, despite cultural backgrounds, despite um, political views. Um, you know, you get a good classic song on, people are dancing, they're communicating, they're laughing. Um, and even those of us who don't smile often, like me, you know, you might get a head nod or a foot tap. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I think everything about music is cool. Yeah, it's like there's um, there's this idea, uh, basically a hypothesis on. Well, so first off, there's a concept called entrainment, and entrainment is the unconscious physical movement of uh, of the body reacting to sound. And there are other animals that experience it. Like there's like a famous uh, parrot that you know headbangs. Um, it might not be a parrot, but his name's Snowball. He's awesome. Uh, but there's also a, like a, a seal that 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 does it. But um, human beings are the only species that we know of at this point that every uh, every being experiences entrainment. And what it is is that when there's some kind of pulsated rhythm, uh, humans will be consistent within a pulse, and it can be anything from you know, finger moving all the way to your toe tapping or, you know, full on like head banging and just getting into the groove. Um, but there's a hypothesis to it that um, uh, that in our early days, our ancient days, when we were in the hunter gatherer phase, that music was actually a way um, to get everybody into an altered state of consciousness so that uh, they would move as one when, when a, a hunt was going on. And so they would often play uh, drums and, uh, I mean, just rhythmic things with their body to just get into the zone together. And, you know, you, you go to contemporary culture and, I mean, any any uh, warrior, you know, like you think about the Rojavan revolutionaries uh, uh, right now in northern Syria, there's, there's just a gigantic uh, use of music before going out into a potentially dangerous space. Um, and there, there's just something about uh, the entrainment, the, the, I'll call it like the collective entrainment that, that takes place. And um, that was one reason um, I was really uh, interested in, in Annie's perspective today, uh, just because, um, you know, you're a person who has tons of experience with with leading crowds uh, in song, um, <clears throat> and it, uh, you know, uh, I'll, I'll just say like, you know, somebody like Lisa or myself, like we're we're you know, quote unquote, uh, professional musicians, whatever the fuck that means in in a capitalist culture. But you know, we're we're people who have really spent um, a lot of time developing uh, the the craft of it. However, I'm always blown away that everybody is musical in in some way and that we have this sort of block uh, on, on who is and who isn't, you know, musically gifted. And, um, and, you know, I think it's a farce. I think it's, it's literally a false consciousness um, that we've kind of conditioned ourselves to believe. But uh, Annie is somebody who has just uh, tons of experience with, with music making for the community. And before um, I throw it back at you, uh, just um, one of my favorite quotes is, uh, uh, for the Sing in Solidarity chorus that I heard Annie say at, um, it was actually at an event for Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, uh, but um, there's the famous anarchist slogan, no gods, no masters. And Annie, when uh, inviting people to join the chorus, she was like, no gods, no masters, no auditions. All right, see you later. And uh, I just, I thought that was really, really brilliant sloganing, but uh, yeah. Um. Right. I mean, just to, to re respond to some of the things that you've been talking about, I think I was thinking about when um, when you're mentioning uh, like communal, I can't remember the word that you used, uh, an entrenchment, 
what was the word? Entrainment. Um, Entrainment, uh, yeah. And I remember on the picket line, we had a lot of people who had never held, who had never chanted before on a picket line, who had never held a megaphone. And it is like a musical thing to be able to chant for long periods of time, even though you're not exactly singing. Um, but then I, I heard more and more every day after day after day, we were on strike for 26 days, I think. And uh, in, in total, as longest adjunct strike uh, ever. And day after day after day, I saw people get better. And I saw people kind of lose themselves in, uh, in, in making, uh, in chanting. And sometimes they would stop chanting and they would start singing. They're singing the chants or just launching into the chorus of Solidarity Forever, which side are you on? Um, and, uh, and they just get better and better and better at it. And eventually we had this like core group of, uh, a lot of them were students uh, undergraduates who were out supporting their teachers and they would they had the megaphone and they would like get together in little groups in the middle of the picketers the picketers walked in a circle around them and uh and sometimes there'd be a couple of like music professors there playing horns playing drums um like a guitarist and they'd form a little um ad hoc band that would play along to the chanting and they just formed their like a little community uh, day after day after day of like and learn how to inspire people to keep going to keep the energy up and they got better at it and then uh, a few days before the strike ended uh, a group of them um, and I think a lot of like the our core like student supporters were were a big part of it uh, they had a rally and announced that uh, in order to support their teachers they were going to occupy um, what's called the university center at the new school which is this giant neoliberal boondoggle of a building that they have not since they have not finished paying for since the 2008 recession and they are, and it's currently being occupied by these undergraduates who were our student supporters who have uh, yeah, like we the, we got uh, we got our contract, but they're still at it. They're still occupying the building, and it was that like community that they kind of started at, at the picket line with um, with these musicians and training people to to be in the moment and and building that community of themselves. And it 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 just it, it formed very organically, and now it's sort of become a political uh, action that's sort of independent of the strike. Wow. So, so interesting. Sorry, Dorian, were you speaking? Am I talking over you? Um, that's fascinating. It's the, the history of it. You know, if we think about work, work songs, you know, on chain gangs and we think about slavery and, and how chants were used as a protest then as well. And to send, you know, sending messages and sending messages that um, overseers and 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 the people in in charge couldn't understand, you know, and and how that that sort of um, visceral uh, messaging um, I think is endemic. In it, it's the same in what we what we use today. That's where it came from, right? Those are the roots of, of what we're using today. Um, I love the fact that that you were saying, um, Annie, that people get got better and better at it you know, it's like a mantra, right? You just, it's a rhythm and it takes you. Um, and when you feel, you feel the power of it, you can't help but try to expand upon it. I just, I, I find it fascinating, your, the, the recount of, of, of what you were doing there. Yeah, I think it, it, I was also really fascinated by watching a lot of these students on the picket line um, pick up the megaphone for the first time and start chanting and get better at not just like, you know, having like breath control and, um, uh, and volume, but also pedagogy. They would, they got better at teaching the chants to the crowd. They learned, they figured out, okay, this is like a three part long chant and I have to, uh, and, and figuring out how many times do you have to repeat it before the, if it's call and response, the, uh, the picketers would pick up that that was their that was now it's now it's their turn. Yeah, um, I agree. I think that is amazing to hear, um, but also how you know you guys as a community, you know, standing up against this thing, 
manifested into a whole nother community. Um, and, you know, I think that's the beauty of it, you know, especially during, and I think it be that happened quite often. Um, you know, when we were working in Rikers, we would go into a unit, nobody talks to each other, nobody really knows each other. People are from the seven neighborhoods of New York City, but not necessarily, you know, haven't ever, ever met each other. Um, and to your point, you know, the first session may be like, I don't listen to that type of music. I don't really care about that. Um, and then by the time we're three, four sessions and folks are like, hey, you know, they're coming today, make sure you're ready. You know, um, I've even had the experience of work dope um, gentlemen who were all musically inclined in their own way, because we all are, um, and got to the point where they were like collaborating on songs. But it started with us just listening to music, you know, from nowhere, just at a base level, listening to music. And then that turned into them choosing music that they loved most and that resonated with them. Or, you know, to, to your example, a chant that like we all have to sing. And then they started teaching it to each other. And before you know, we have like a whole chorus going on. Um, and that led into a whole nother musical community. And I remember talking to some of the gentlemen after we left and them saying like, yeah, we're still writing together. Um, so just that small experience built now another a musical community within the confines of that space. So yeah, that's the power of music. That's the power of music. Those are <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was um. I when when I first started working at at Rikers, um, it, I I had like this old guy experience, like the like holy fuck, I'm actually in the next generation because, like, you know, it's, it's that kind of like I I wanted to relate to the folks and it was like, yeah, I love hip hop music, which is true, but um, you know, it's like the artists I listen to are like Wu Tang Clan and Nas and Eminem and you know like. MF Doom and you know and it was like it's it just very clear that you know that's like a lot of the the gentlemen you know, well the people you know not just not just men but uh, a lot of the individuals we were working with were uh, like that's what their parents listen to that kind of music um and so a lot of the folks they they listen to drill music you know specifically Brooklyn drill and um when I first heard it uh it actually like I had the old person experience where it was like the fuck is this shit like it's it, you know like the lyrics are like blunt and kind of stupid and like the the beats are good like they're good but like they don't sound like you know as like sophisticated as you know some of the some of the, some of the beats that that I like but um it was actually uh, a chef G interview where he was talking about how um you know just drill music and he was like, yeah, like, you know, we can do all that poetry shit, but we're still getting shot by the fucking cops. So we just say it as it is. And like, it just like changed my entire perspective where it was like, this music is created. The beats are made on open source software. So a lot of people are making things on like GarageBand or Audacity. So it's like, it's like, that's why the beats sound the way they are. And then the lyrics, it's like, they're blunt because it's they because they want it to be blunt and it was just a huge eye opener but the 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 biggest eye opener um and you know i'm, I'm this is all internal none of this was ever externalized to you know the, the people that we were working with but um but there there is no way to take back the experience of you know i'll take an artist like k flack or an artist like meek mill and you know you put these are two artists that um they're 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 good like a lot of people like them on the outside but on the inside um they are talking about things that are three or four la layers deep um that that if you've never been locked up you're not ever going to understand the the visceral somatic experience of of what these artists are saying and you know just being in a room listening to k flock and there are 40 people just in unison like bobbing their heads and they know every single word. And it just was, it was one of those, like, I'll never forget that. And it was just an eye opener where it was like, oh, my initial like response to this music was because I was coming from a different perspective. And I, and I, I'm coming as like an open-minded person and I still had like a, a visceral response, but just the realization it was like, well, that's because the music 
is not coming from a space that I'm coming from. It's coming from another community. And um, yeah, I don't know if uh, if you have any thoughts on that, um, Di Marisa, just because you were also in the rooms a lot of time uh, yeah. when that was happening. Yeah, um, I definitely the, the visuals that the words create and the images that they create uh, your microphone, your microphone got real weird. Oh, are we good now? Are we still weird? You're good now. You're good now. Um, yeah, so I definitely use the lyrics of the songs and like being in those spaces to bring myself into the space, like of where sometimes where folks are coming from. Um, also just being upfront and saying like, yo, these lyrics are hard to hear. <laughs> Why are you guys writing this? And I remember a young man said, this is the news. And so like the reason why we write these songs is to let people know what's going on without having to, you know, be on the phone or be on Facebook. A lot of it is a response to, I don't know if you guys were aware, but I think it started about eight years ago. Um, NYPD was going into like New York City housing developments and doing raids. And they were taking hundreds of young people out at a time. And most of the cases were around social media. So they were using inbox conversations, Instagram conversations to say that these young people allegedly committed crimes. And a lot of them were not true. And a lot of young people went to prison for eight, 10 years. Some are still in prison from those raids. And they went through each housing, they're still doing it, but they went through each housing development in each borough one at a time to, to do this. So the young people got smarter and they're like, so we're not writing each other on Instagram. We're not writing each other on Facebook. We will put in, in code similar to what you were saying, Lisa, about like how we used to kind of code the, the, the news so that the, the overseer didn't know what we were talking about. It's that. And so from that lens, I'm like, y'all are freaking dope. Uh, because all I hear is, ha, ha, ha. I don't know what you're saying. So you definitely decoded it for me. Um, but just to be that creative, just to think, you know, on your toes in that way, because, and, and also understanding the importance of like, yeah, I might be from Harlem, but my brothers in South Africa need to know what's going on too. And my brothers in Astoria need to know what's going on too. How can I communicate the message without, you know, getting caught up in the legal system? So it gave me a new appreciation for drill music. Um, and definitely the hardest part is that, you know, most people have a visceral response to the sound and to what they're saying. But when you know that these are young people's experiences, my thought is like, how are you gonna heartbreak that? You know, it has to be heartbreaking to know that young people, 13, there's a young boy now who's doing drill. He's like 13, 12 years old, are experiencing so much death, are experiencing so much, you know, just homelessness other things um i'd rather have a visceral response to that and you know so yeah wow that's that's incredible um and and the, i mean i remember i had a hard childhood growing up and, and listening to music and having the connection okay there, there's two things there's one create the creation of empathy which is i think um often why we write but this idea of being able to see yourself or see your story or know that you're not alone um, is that I'm, I'm, I'm hearing from you about the drills, the drill music, which I, I'm not familiar with. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, there, there's something about, and I think it's the same also obviously on the picket line or, or um, with protest music is, is yes, I, I, I understand this. Like I, that I am also that, right? Yeah, I have, um, <clears throat> I don't want to over talk, uh, but um, just wanted to put this in there. Uh, did anybody want, want to speak before I say anything? No? All right, cool. Yeah, so there were um, three separate experiences in Rikers that came to mind about just culture and community that um, these are 
these are incredible. Um, the first one was uh, one of the individuals I was working with. He's an older gentleman from Egypt. Uh, he's he was in on a on a pretty serious charge. Um, really nice guy, really talented. Um, I'm not going to say why because I don't want to say who he is, but he's well known um, to a certain extent. And uh, he was in a room, you know, his his dorm that he was in was a lot of uh, guys from the Bronx and, and oh, no, not the Bronx, sorry. A uh, lot, lot of folks from Brooklyn and Staten Island and, and Queens. Um, and all, I'd say like, early 30s uh late 20s was kind of the kind of the age range um but this egyptian gentleman just didn't really participate in any of the music experiences and you know i asked him it was like yeah like what kind of music you like and he was like oh you know i'm not uh, i don't really listen to music it's like okay um so i figured out how old he was and googled uh what um the you know billboard charts were in egypt in the 1980s and just downloaded a whole bunch of songs because you have to download music to bring it into the jail and uh without telling him and i didn't know any of these songs nor understand any of the words but i hit play um on one of them and it was this egyptian song from the 80s pop song and he's on his bunk and he just like shoots up and he comes running into the room with everybody. He was like, how the, what did you know this? No, no, no. And he starts telling us about the singer. He was like, no, you don't understand. She came from, she came from this particular village. And, and just like this song is about her relationship with her father. And like, all of a sudden, like all the, you know, the other folks are just like, yeah, yeah. And like, we start talking about the history of Egypt. And they had never actually talked to him about his own culture. He had not spoken about it. And um, the second week, you know, he participated in every group after that. It was it was un unreal. But um, the second part or second session, I put on a more meditative thing, and he literally got into a chant a trance, and his eyes were closed, and he was just doing this like oh, <laughs> he was doing this really wild uh, movement to it, and it just he was literally in a trance. And I remember watching the other guys just like watching him and like smiling and just learning something. Second part, uh, second one was there was a woman who is from China, a um, little younger than I am. And same thing, uh, you know, I don't really like music, blah, blah, blah. And um, did this really, uh, it was one of the more complicated figuring out what kind of music she listens to. I was like, well, what kind of music, uh, you know, from China? Like what's something that like you listened to when you were growing up? And she would kind of pronounce the word and I would write down what I heard and then asked her if she could write it. She wrote it in Chinese symbols. So I then Googled these, uh, you know, what I heard and matched it if I saw the Chinese le letters and was like, all right, cool, found this artist and then downloaded that artist, like, you know, their top like 10 hits or something. And there were like three or four artists came in started playing it and uh i'm not going to mention the name but d marie so there was an individual in that room uh older person who always had something to say uh and th this older person she was like i don't want to listen to no chinese shit sorry if that sounds offensive but that's exactly what she said um and then literally started hitting play and she was like ah no, that's pretty good and, <laughs> and it was this big moment of where this individual experienced their perception on what a culture was, and then all of a sudden learned so much just from that musical experience. Um, and then the third thing, and this will be the last one of just to say it, but um, Lewis, if you could link up, um, this is a video of some of the students at the new school who were in solidarity with the strikers. Um, and I don't know where this video came from. So Annie, maybe you can explain it after we take a look at it. It's really short, but um, Lewis, if you could sync that up. All right, it's gonna take a minute to adjust it, but here we go.
Oh, that gave me chills. Uh, so Annie, if you could give some perspective on that video. Uh, yeah, I'm not actually sure who took it. I, I think I, I grabbed it off of one of our um, our picket WhatsApps, but uh, that's taking place inside the occupied classroom building at the new school after the students took it over last week. And they had been listening to, I think probably most of those students had never heard that song before before the strike. And now, and they're like in there sitting in a circle, singing it pretty well, like with like, with harmonies and and you know rhythmic clapping and like uh, making like a, a beautiful sound and it, as a sort of community collective togetherness activity for because it's I don't know I've never actually occupied a building that's I'm that people didn't do that when I was in in college and then I kind of aged out of my my occupy years but uh, I think it's it's really very very hard to keep it going like with anything like with the picket line like it's not hard to put a picket line for together for one day well i mean it is it is extremely hard i won't say that it's very very hard but uh the hardest part is like the 13 14 hour picket line day and then having to get up at 6 a.m 5 a.m the next day and do it again and then do it again and then do it again and what it does to your body and um having to uh, having to do that every day and then having to simultaneously keep up your energy so that you can inspire other people to keep coming back. Like I'm a paid staff organizer for the union. It was my job to keep coming back, but we were relying mostly on um, on volunteers. And in order to um, get strike pay for the UAW, you have to do a certain number of hours on the picket line. Um, but uh, we needed people to come even more than, you know, than, than like the the minimum, we needed people to come back the maximum number of times, and so you have to kind of put on a lot of energy to um, to into your picket line, into your occupation to keep going, and that's what that's what that music is for. It's just like how do you? This is how it's a you know survival mechanism. It's how you keep your action alive. It's how you, you and you, it also it gives the impression of the of uh, of organization. Like I think chants are good, songs are better because you're singing, you're singing, you're dancing in chorus, you sound, you're kind of imposing. That's impressive. That's like intimidating to uh, to management, to whoever is is um, that you are you are fighting, and uh, and so singing really uh, it keeps your community together and it um, and it keeps you it literally empowers you to act to act collectively and to and with strength towards a common purpose. Mm. I love that. That's so, sorry. That's so incredibly true. That's so incredibly true about um, the fact that it's intimidating. I love that. Mm. Um, because because the power that is behind, the energy that's behind the, those um, chants or songs is palpable to those people in power, you know? Um, you can't help but feel that. So I, that's that's lovely. I've never thought of it that way, but of course it's intimidating. That's wonderful. I want to uh, interject here. We're co we're coming up on the t the top of the hour pretty soon, and I know we have another video that we want to play. Ca uh, can we can we shift and and preface this video? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so uh, the. <laughs> All right. Um, first off, I'm not going to lie. Uh, just hearing um, what you were speaking about, Annie, it, it um, I, so I literally had therapy like right before coming to this. Uh, so I'm actually like in a pretty emotionally charged uh, space right now because um, I was actually talking about the opposite side of communal music with my therapist about. Um, you know, hate groups using music as a as in a way to infiltrate the unconscious and how it's like people don't realize like music, do, oh, it's a fun thing, but it's like it is a powerful device uh, and it can be used for, it can be used for, for bad. Um, uh, and in fact, Di Marisa and I on our podcast, one of our hopefully uh, soon to be upcoming guests is actually going to be talking to us about um, the use of music and torture at Guantanamo Bay. Um, and uh, just, just uh, it, anyways, so that, that's what I was talking about with my therapist. Uh, and then um, 
seeing just, I'm not going to lie, like anytime I see the, the, the youth movements or the elders, it, it just hits in a different way. Um, and just seeing, seeing those, those youth just like singing a song, as you had said, that they didn't even fucking know uh, the day before. And now like, now this is going to be with them. Um, but there's a, a, a really famous artist, um, you know, and protest uh, thinker who was actually murdered by, uh, by the state, um, Joe Hill. He was uh, one of the, I don't know if he was a founding member of the IWW, but he was a, he was a major organizer with the industrial workers of the world. And like, I think the, um, what they call the little red song book is, I think it's like half Joe Hill songs basically. Um, and he would do just like parody songs of like r religious hymns, basically saying, fuck you to the capitalists. But um, he has a quote uh, and it's all the world is made of music. We are all strings on a lyre. We resonate, we sing together. Um, and then the other quote, which I'm trying to find, because uh, I've used it before, but um, I, it speaks about music as a way to spread a message that um, if you can, if you can get uh, into, you, you can use music to get into the the psyche and and spread a message more than you can of having a theoretical discussion sometimes. Um, but all of that. Uh, to get myself down to actually talk about what the last video is, but um, there's uh, you know the the revolutionary artist Bob Marley um, was just a, a a deep thinker and um, just a, a profound lyricist and and a profound uh, just knew how to speak really really hard truths in such a digestible way you know it's, it's like if you think about reggae music it feels good like it just feels good i've lived uh actually the neighborhood i live in now it's um mostly hasidic and caribbean which are two very interesting cultures to be immersed in because I, I am neither of them but um during the summer the reggae music it's just everywhere and it like it just feels good but not only that there's a religious notion to it and bob marley is talking about colonization and and being oppressed and and but also talking about connecting with spiritual beyonds and and all of this and um so anyways the song i chose uh to play is um is one love uh which um it, it it's it's just it's a po powerful piece of music um i want to just read the uh the the chorus lyrics once i once i pull it up uh because of course i typed in one love and the nas version came up because i look at hip-hop more than i look at reggae uh but um <laughs> but anyways yeah. um yeah yeah the the one thing um Okay, yeah, so the, the lyrics are one love, one heart, let's get together and feel all right. Hear the children crying and saying thanks and praise to the Lord and I will feel all right. Saying let's get together and feel all right. And that's the chorus over and over and over again. And it's just, um, it's about being together. And, you know, I, there's a religious connotation to it. And I think we can analyze that, you know, I'm not religious. We can analyze that as a, a spiritual processing. Um, but the last thing I wanted to say before we play the video and then uh, get out of here with uh, some final, final dialogue, uh, but in reggae music, the rhythm, the... That is a heartbeat. It's literally boom, 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 boom. boom. So there is an actual uh, rhythmic connotation to to the body. There's a somatic experience in the music as as a root. You know, it, it's like it's in all the reggae stuff. And you know, if if you've ever played reggae, I don't I don't know how many people have have done it, but uh, you know, I, I played with a couple of uh, really hip ass reggae musicians and. When you when you play that one rhythm in your left hand on the organ for an hour, like you're not on earth anymore. It, it's like it takes you to a new dimension. Um, but the reason I bring that up is this is, uh, you know, as all of these are free improvised compositions, they're not um, 
I'm never following the structure the way like it's in there, but I'm not following it as a goal. It's like if I fall out of the structure, that is what is allowed to happen. But there's a moment where I literally accidentally bumped uh the sound button i was trying to go to a synthesizer and then ended up going to the heartbeat and so i jammed on the heartbeat sound uh the, you know the midi heartbeat effect and uh yeah so with that let's just take a listen and then we'll have some closing dialogue
Ashe. Beautiful. Yeah. So I, I found the quote from Joe Hill. Uh, it's a pamphlet, no matter how good, is never read more than once, but its song is learned by heart and repeated over and over. I maintain that if a person can put a few common sense facts into a song and dress them up, cloak them in humor, uh, he will succeed in reaching a different number of workers who are, I don't agree with this part, who are too unintelligent and or too indifferent to read. Indifferent, perhaps. Yeah, I think indifferent's good. Uh, but, you know, he's a working class man from the early 1900s, so <laughs> it's, you know, it's how he talked. But yeah, did anybody have any... Um, I guess thoughts uh, before we come to a close. I'd like to hear uh, from from each of you. <laughs> I'll go first. I guess there we're speaking. We <laughs> <laughs> um, I just love the way that you can articulate so many different emotions through music. Um, I feel like each time I listen to any of your improvisations, um, I can see myself and feel myself in all of that was today, which is so important. Um, because sometimes we're kind of on the hamster wheel, so we don't get time to just really be. Um, and so just thank you for sharing your craft with us and like your artistry and, and in some ways your medicine, because music is like a medicinal palette. 
um, you know, it's been a, a long few days and I definitely was able to process some stuff. So I appreciate that. And I pass. Well, I found all of you fascinating and, and enjoyed this as, as always. Um, uh, Dorian, I, I left in the chat, which I guess people can see um, some of my comments about what, what your, what I think your si sort of signature thing is. And, and I love the layering that you do, the complexity of your music, but, and then, but the fact that you start out simple and then and you, and you layer, 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 and then you bring it back down. It's like, um, it's very healing. It's a very uh, involved, beautiful process. And then last comment, I wanted to talk about um, using your comments about using music for the bad, you know? <laughs> um, and I think that's it's true that uh, it's a galvanizing force in, in whichever way we choose to use it, you know? And there does exist that. I It made me, it made me think of, um, Trump's use of music and um, so many artists who uh, protested the fact that he was using their songs at his rallies, um, right? Because they don't want to be associated with that and they don't want that to, it to be used in a, in a way that is misinterpreting the heart of, of the music. Um, so yeah, I just, I just found this whole thing really, really fascinating. I'm gonna slide out right now because it's after midnight here in Italy. So um, I wanna say that Di Marisa, it was such a pleasure to see you again. You're such a beauty and it's it's wonderful to have to have seen you. Annie, what, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm really impressed and I hope I, that our paths cross again. It's a tiny world and uh, they probably will. <laughs> and I thank hope you. so, Lisa. Thank you for sharing your stories. Just absolutely fascinating. And uh, Dorian, I love you. I love all of you. And, and, and thank you for having me. And I will see you next time. I'm just going to slip out and let you guys say goodbye. See you. I should. Lisa, I'll talk to you very, very soon. Peace, solidarity. Peace. Um, and Annie, I just want to say thank you. Um, it takes a lot. Dorian and I know we went through a very hard time in our workplace. Um, and so it's beautiful to know that there are people like you out in the world who are willing to go 28 days, 100 days, however many days to ensure that people are being treated fairly. Um, so I appreciate your work. And also, you know, I appreciate your influence on the youth. Um, you know, there is a quote, I, I don't want to quote it because the person who quoted it is not that good. But there, he was spot on in what he said and that like when you, um, when the youth hear you and they follow you and they trust you, you know, you make in, endless possibilities for the world. So um, I appreciate it. And however we can support you, please let us know. Uh, thank you so much, De Marissa. That's really nice to hear. And I appreciate you too. I mean, yeah, just like on a, on a final note, I just was thinking about that uh, that Joe Hill quote that you just read, Dorian, and how um, he goes directly for the um, what is what is practical in music, and I think that I am a writer, and I write fiction, I write nonfiction, I write journalism, and um, and I consider myself an, an artist, and I. I think for many years, I thought that the practice of art and the practice of organizing or activism were, were kind of the same. That because art makes me feel a certain way, that that's the same thing as political action. And what I learned as an organizer that it's not, that it's not the same. Music art is not the same as political action. That they have a, can have a a a part in each other and 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 aid each other, but they're not the same thing. And what I love about the IWW songs and what they, how they have been kept alive for over a century is because they're beautiful and the lyrics are beautiful and um, you know, but and and very very memorable. But they're also very useful. They're very practical. You can you can sing them over and over again. You can change out the lyrics, and they're uh, and you can shout them on a picket line over a brass band and be understood. 
and they have a politi- they have a very specific political message that you know you repeat it over and over again and you know better than a pamphlet you learn that message you learn about uh the, the uh like historical materialism by listening to this music and so it's working on multiple levels and there's not like in the american tradition there's you know a few different schools of music that do that but it's certainly not uh, not everywhere, and I think that's I think what the more I learn about about organizing and and music is how there has there is a kind of music that belongs on a picket line, and we need a lot more of it. And it you kind of you can only you only know if it belongs on a picket line if you try it on a picket line. You see if it works. Yeah. <clears throat> Uh, Lewis, did you have anything you wanted to say before uh, I give the closer? I'm not usually at a loss for words, uh, but uh, I am. I'm pretty overwhelmed by the conversations that you are all having, and um, what occurs to me most is that we don't often get to see things like this. Uh, all I could think about as you were talking about sort of matter in a matter of fact way the work that each of you are doing is how many people even know the language and understand or even exposed to the worlds that you are in so i'm really pleased that this exists to present to people and um i also found it interesting annie's comment about uh art music and politics or or social protest not being the same that they intersect and I kind of sit at that intersection pretty often in my job um, but it was a revelation to me to to realize that they're not the same uh, and I, I I guess all I have to say is I have a lot to take away from this personally from being a part of this you know uh, to to think about and to learn from uh, and and push forward, you know, because each person has a role. Um, I'll have some closing comments because I want to kind of do my sales pitch on on you know what's coming up and all of that. But uh, turn it back over. We we still have it. We still have a couple of minutes for you to wrap up, Dorian, and 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 yeah, and, you know, yeah. Well, you know, I really wanted to thank uh, you know Lewis. Thank you for the opportunity to to do this entire series. Um, and uh, you know, record release at the end of at the end of this. Um, and then you know, Annie, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, you know, massive amounts of respect for the work you do, um, and just uh, it, you know, in multi multiple areas. Uh, you know, um, Di Marisa, you know, love you. You know, you're you're like heart and soul kind of kind of camaraderie. Uh, you know, it's. Uh, yeah, I, I always refer to you as my, you know, partner, partner in justice. Um, and then, uh, yeah, Lisa, even though you're not here right this moment, uh, you know, always inspired by just your organic way of understanding um, the, the human experience. Like, there's never a moment that doesn't feel authentic or genuine. Um, not that, not that anybody else isn't feeling authentic in this group, but Lisa just has a has a particular energy that um, that I've really found appreciative. Um, so to close out, uh, so first off, uh, I did just want to let you know, uh, Lewis, that it's titled incorrectly. Uh, it says episode three, Youth Against Fascism. That's next episode. This is episode two, uh, Community and Music. So just uh, might want to edit that, uh, just post-production. Let it be known that counting is not one of my better skills. Yeah. <laughs> if i yeah. was gonna make a mistake it, it had to be between one and three right yeah one, yeah two, yeah three. we'll get it out yeah. of the way early yeah yeah um but uh yeah it just you know I, i'm really honored to to know everybody who's on here and um one of the one of the purposes of this is to make sure that these dialogues are happening on a on a more major platform um you, you know uh I, I was just watching uh, an interview with um, with Redman talking about Eminem 
dissing Trump at the BET. And it's just, uh, he talked about like how it's so important to use your platforms. Uh, like he was like, man, like he could have gone out there, spit some shit, would have been badass, but no, he fucking dissed the president, like for for our movement. That's important. And um, and I was just thinking about like what just happened a few days ago with Lizzo, how she brought out um, just a, a multitude of activists. Like there's a woman who uh, wrote a book, a booklet on how to how to um, report hate crimes because there's so much anti-Asian hate going on with, with the COVID-19 experience. And then um, she had this 15 year old organizer from Africa who's working on getting girls education rights. And it just, it was just really inspiring seeing all these women that she had on. And, um, you know, I, I now follow all of them on Twitter and like, you know, have, have now like just started to learn about it. So there's something about these platforms that's really, really important to have, have these dialogues. Um, I will, but, say, uh, I will suggest oh, yeah. Mastodon uh, as, for all for everyone out there yeah like migrate to another platform where people are actually communicating with each other you mean not where the ceo is putting out conspiracy theories that are going to get people killed i didn't, uh, say, I didn't say that yeah <laughs> yeah no, no. um <laughs> Uh, so for, for, for next, um, the next one, I think we tentatively scheduled it for February 2nd, which is uh, Elena Groundhog's Day. February 3rd, yeah. February 3rd, yeah. So, so it's, oh, February 2nd is my birthday. <gasps> Happy birthday in advance. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Wow. Yeah, so it's, you know, it's connected to Groundhog's Day, uh, which uh, I've always found some spiritualness to that. Uh, just in and of itself, there's something about the repetition, and I, I don't know. I just I, yeah, I, I no, I, I hear you loud and clear in the context of everything that we're doing. It's like, are we really here again? Yeah, like, yeah. Are we, still, like, are we still saying the same things on the picket <laughs> lines as and everywhere else as we were years ago? Yeah, yeah. Again, and literally again. the same thing. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. It's the same requests, the same actions, in many ways, the same campaigns. Yeah. There's an and irony to, for me for today. I'm just kind of reflecting. For some reason, I started my day listening to uh, Preservation Act One by a band called The Kinks, uh, and there's a song on there called "Money and Corruption." I am your man, which speaks to all of what was happening in England and and Ireland uh, in his day. And I remember at the time in the 60s and 70s, people were like, ah, oh, really? Like, there's big stages. Music is music. Stop. Are you still talking about unions? <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's, it, 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 it strikes uh, true today. So it's really interesting to, to have this conversation tonight. I think uh, Di Marisa, you were gonna say something. No, no, no. I was just excited about my birthday. <laughs> Happy birthday! Happy birthday! Do it. Well, I think we'll wrap it up. I, I just want to yeah, say. Yeah. Um, so February third, I believe, is the correct date for the next uh, version of this uh, episode three, as I've been corrected. Uh, I also want to remind people to follow, ring the bell. Check it out on Twitter. Uh, you know, support. This is not, it may seem casual, but these are people who are pouring their hearts and their lives and their time into, uh, in, an, in, in a seemingly impossible battle to make a better life for everyone on the planet. And that is an important choice that you can make to support that and very simply just follow and tell people and move on. Uh, I'll be back here next Thursday at 5 p.m. for Rope It Ope Selected, where I pick some interesting tracks from the Rope It Ope catalog and play them into uh, live stream and in the metaverse. And then we'll have uh, uh, some interesting announcements coming up for 2023. I had to take it out with some Christmas music, so uh, I, I want to shout out 
uh, and it's in the room and I don't have my notes in front of me, but if you, if you look on the video, um, or <laughs> how are they going to find this? Um, I'm going to need a minute to figure it out. Dorian, anything else you'd like to say while I do that? I got, I got one last. Uh, so I actually just pulled up my copy of uh, the IWW uh, Little Red Songbook because um, that is just a major, I mean, literally, like it's just this little booklet of a lot of songs. And yeah, <laughs> Annie's got one too. Um, but uh the Music Workers Alliance, um, one of the major campaigns that they're uh, fighting for is, is against um, the just shitty pay that Spotify gives its artists. Um, and the, you know, they're a multi-billion dollar company. Um, and uh, there's a gentleman who um, who's one of the major organizers, um, also a badass guitar player, um, uh, Mark, Mark Rebo, uh, but his he was organizing a campaign against Spotify. And this is a song, Solidarity Forever, um, where, I mean, this was, the lyrics were written a hundred years ago. And this is literally the, the lyric um, that Mark had chosen uh, as, as the campaign spirit uh, for music workers against Spotify. Uh, but the, the, the verse goes, it is we who plowed the prairies, built the cities where they trade, dug the mines and built the workshops, endless miles of railroad laid. Now we stand outcast and starving mid the wonders we have made, but the union, uh, the union makes us strong. It's the same fucking thing. <laughs> it's the same fucking thing. We need to bring it all together. Thank you. Yeah. I appreciate you. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to switch it over and take it out with, and I, and I have that information. This, this is, a uh, something that came into my inbox, um, uh, a, a, a band called the fundamental sound. And they have an album called lo-fi Christmas, uh, out on uh, Bandcamp and on other platforms. And, uh, it's probably the most refreshing thing for me to listen to at this time of year after hearing Christmas songs endlessly repeated as a drumbeat of uh uh you know commercial marketing so the songs are good uh and this this puts it in good context thank you all we'll see you